Thank you, young people. That was wonderful. I've enjoyed the service tonight. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Philippians. I want to preach this evening on an unusual God. An unusual God. We serve an unusual God. He's unusual because his ways are above our ways. And his thoughts are above our thoughts. It's because he is holy. There's not much holiness around here. Because he's a loving God. There's not a lot of love in this world. You know, the psalmist said, I've been young and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He's unusual in that he continues to provide us perpetual blessings, unending blessings that are new every morning. His mercies are new every day. Every day we can come to him if we'll confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's unusual because his ways are so above and beyond our ways. He's so powerful. He's so great. He's so awesome. It's hard for us in our limited minds to get a grasp of how great a God he is. And yet, he's so tender and kind and knows and cares about every part of your life tonight. And we can go to him and uh, he continues to meet our needs every day. Now, Paul knew a little bit about this unusual God, and that's why Paul was unusual here in the book of Philippians. Philippians is one of the prison epistles, and Paul was in prison in Rome. He's at the end of his life, and he's remembering He's looking back. You know, I've met a lot of people at the end of their life uh, that re had a lot of regrets. I've met a lot of people in the, fun uh, in the, in the hospital and, and at funerals that would tell me that they'd wasted their life. They have all kinds of regrets. But I've never met somebody that knew God, that loved God, that served God that walked with God, that had any regrets. Because God is unusual because things are a mess down here. I don't know if you figured it out, but that's not the plan that God has. He's talking about the divorce. He's talking about the alcohol. He's talking about the abuse and all the things that we see. That's not what God intended. That's what the devil's doing. That's what the flesh and the world is doing. But we have an unusual God that worked in Paul's life. And here he is in prison, and he writes a book about joy. And how can you rejoice and have priorities in your life that even though you may be having troubles, you can still have joy. Even though we have opposition, we can still be victorious in Christ. I can do all things, Paul said, through Christ that strengthens me. Paul remembers those at Philippi that helped him and were a blessing to him. Philippi is a city in northern Greece, and the Bible called it Macedonia. And he's remembering them in chapter 1 and verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Hey, that's a good testimony, isn't it? Paul's in jail and he says, thank God for those people that loved me, that supported me, that helped me and encouraged me. He says in verse 16, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. You might underline that word because he is in jail. And yet he's writing them, out of great love, Jesus went to the cross and proved his love for us as he died and, and shed his blood for us. That's unusual. I mean, think about Jesus, where he was born, in Bethlehem, the house of bread, a little place. <laughs> you know, we would think if God was going to come, he'd come into a famous big city. But God does things in a different way than what we would do. 
In chapter 2, we have the great verse of verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. As God begins to transform our thinking, we see more that this world is unusual. We see that sin and what it does to people and God uh, works in our lives to the point, he says in verse 10, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things of heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Look at verse 17 and 18. Remember, Paul's in jail. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Notice if you would in verse 19 of chapter 3, as Paul says, whose end is destruction. He's talking in verse 18 about the enemies of the cross, those that oppose God, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory, who glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, if we're going to get to know the unusual God, we have to get a heavenly mind, setting our affections on things above, looking at the eternal, not the temporal, and looking at the spiritual and not the physical. And he says there in verse 20, for our conversation, our citizenship, our behavior, our manner of life is in heaven. From hence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, God sees the end from the beginning. He's not limited by time, and he sees us already seated in heavenly places. And it's hard for us to understand it. And then in chapter 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. If you drop down to verse 10, he says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, and whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. For I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. We haven't learned much about how to be hungry in the last few days. And I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, you have done well that you did communicate with me. That word communicate is talking about giving. I thank God for your generosity and your giving. See, giving makes you more like God. As the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. As we talked last night, you know, the motive for missions is love. People that love God don't have problem with giving. People that don't know God and don't love God won't give. And that selfishness hinders them. The joy of giving, Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. As you keep reading it here, it says that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know, that, know also that in the beginning of the gospel... When I departed from Macedonia, from northern Greece, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So this was the only church that was supporting Paul. Notice verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, which Thessalonica is right by Philippi, and uh, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. I want you to notice, as we think, and I was talking to the young people in chapel, who gets the greatest blessing, the missionary or the church in the missions conference? Well, the missionary gets material things. But I want you to notice that the church gets eternal things and material things. Now notice what it says here in verse 17. Paul says, not that I desired a gift. It wasn't that I was wanting you to give to me. But he said, I desired fruit 
that may abound to your account. You know, anything that you give to God with the right heart and the right motive is going to be eternally rewarded. Revelation 22 says, I come quickly and my reward is with me. Now, I've had a lot of bad investments in my life. You know, you have invested something that was a sure thing, like an oil well that you didn't get anything from, or I name all kinds of stuff. I've invested in things, and it didn't amount to much. But let me say, anything that's given to God is going to bring dividends. Because God says it's going to be added to your account. He says, you're going to have fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Remember, young people in chapel, we said missions is to send. And so we send the missionary, but we also send our gift. We also send our love. We also send our prayer that God would save these families and and work through your camp and your churches and, and the work that you're doing. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. You know, that we serve an unusual God. You know, you look in the Old Testament, it's unusual to sacrifice animals and that to be some type, a subtype of an acceptable sacrifice to God. But that all pictured the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God that would one day come. You know, as God gives us more and more light, we see how awesome a God he is. But my God shall supply all your need. Not only do you get fruit to your account, but God says, I'm going to supply, God's going to supply your need. Now, you, you provided for my need out of your poverty. But God's going to supply your need out of his riches. Notice he says in verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I've learned as we've lived by faith that you can't outgive God. Now, living by faith is something that we have not just talked about, but experienced. You know, it's one thing when you leave your country and go to another country, you're learning about living by faith. And I pastored for a couple of years and God led us to go and start a church. And we didn't raise much support. We just went and started by faith. And I thought, man, I'm not a church planning guy. I don't know anything about church planning. But we went by faith and we sold what we had and gathered up what we could and raised support and we went. I don't remember, I could tell you how God is an unusual God in the way he supplies and answers prayer. One of the reasons our children are serving the Lord is because we stepped out by faith and went and started a church. We got our family together and said, hey, we need to pray. We need $700 for rent, and we don't have it. I had a man call named Peter. He visited the church one time. He says, hey, Brother Bowman, did you read those magazines I gave you? He gave me some magazines on the Mennonites. We had 21 different Mennonite churches in town. We were the only Baptist church in 40-mile radius, any direction. And uh, I said, well, I looked over them. Well, I didn't read them very good because he said, well, the reason I'm calling is I put a check in there for you. <laughs> when he said that, it got my attention. I said, hold on a minute. I knew where they were. They were on the bench out in the garage. I ran out there, dusted it off, then going through them, brrr, and sure enough, there was a check. How much do you think that check was for? $700. Hey, God is an unusual God that's able to supply in unusual ways. We were just in, uh, it seems like we were just down there. It was almost, I guess, a year ago. We were in Bahia Blanca, Argentina. How many have ever been to Argentina? I didn't think so. Uh, Bahia Blanca, Argentina. That's where our daughter and son-in-law are missionaries. And there was a young couple that were there, and they were just learning about financial giving and how that God requires us uh, of us that we give because he doesn't want us to be selfish. And the Bible says that we first should give ourselves to the Lord, and then 
that he was learning about financial stewardship or giving. And so for the first time in his life, he put a tithe, 10% of his income, in the offering. The next week, this young couple, just new in the church, came, the next week he came, Pastor, Pastor, can I give a testimony? Pastor allowed him, Brother Merlot, to give a testimony. He said, you know, last week, by faith, I put my tithe in the offering. He said, this week, I got a raise that exceeded what I put in the offering. God supplies in unusual ways, and in ways that you would never expect. Now, notice what God says in verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need. Now, God didn't say you'd get a brand new Cadillac. Huh? He didn't say he's going to supply your greed. He said he would supply our needs. You know, all of God's blessings are not dollars and cents. Money doesn't mean anything to God. Say, so then why does he want us to give? He doesn't need your money. He wants your love. And where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You can't love somebody and not give. Now you can say, oh, how I love Jesus, but if it never reaches your pocketbook, there's a problem. If you love somebody, you want to do something for them. Amen? And uh, God wants our love. Now here in Philippians, we have a beautiful picture of faith, promise, giving. The church at Philippi, supplied the need for Paul as he was going preaching. And then God, Paul writes back and says, now God's going to add fruit to your account. And not only that, but he's going to supply your need. I remember pastoring a church in Canada. We had some people that were concerned and said, Pastor, we gave $100,000 to missions last year. Think what we could have done here with that. I said, well, let me remind you of something. Last year was the best year financially the church has ever had Amen. in 76 years. Why did they have that? Because they honored God and gave 100,000 to missions. Amen. God will supply your need in unusual ways. Look at a few other verses on this area of, of giving. Look to back to what Jesus said. I was just quoting it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Jesus is talking about giving, about stewardship, about honoring him, about laying up treasures. And it's interesting, unusual God doesn't want us to have treasures down here. He wants our treasures to be in heaven. He says there in verse number 19 of Matthew 6, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor, nor uh, rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. Now notice it says here, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Look over to Luke 6 and verse 38, another promise on giving. As I memorized years ago, Luke 6, 38, it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Now, what we want is we want God to give to us first. I've had people say to me, Well, preacher, if I won the lottery, I would give a portion of it to the church. You know, if God sends the money in, and if there's anything left over at the end of the month, then I will give to God. But that's not what the verse says. That's not what the promise is. That's not exercising faith. By the way, in uh, Matthew, where we were just reading, the last verse, couple of verses, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God wants to be first in your life. If he's not first, he's not Lord. He wants to be Lord of your life. He wants to be first. So notice what the scripture says here. Give, you give first, and it shall be given unto you. Now, how will God give back to you? Well, we, we've, been, we've been talking about an unusual God that gives perpetual, never-ending blessings every day. How many appreciate the air God gives us to breathe? Huh? The food. 
the sunshine. There's so many blessings. You can just go on and on and on about every day. God gives us more and more, uh, and we don't deserve it. Uh, but how will he give it back to you? He'll give you a good measure. It'll be pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bo bosom? For with the same measure you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. We uh, showed you a picture of the church there in Steinbach last night that we, we moved. And um, there was a man that was mad at the church. He was mad at me. And uh, can you imagine a nice guy like me? Why some of you be mad? But he was mad at me. And, and he was doing wrong. And I confronted him about it. And his wife and was trying to help him. But nonetheless, he got mad about it. And I don't know for sure that he did it. But I'm 90-something percent sure. Uh, he came and broke a bunch of windows in the church. Now, he meant to do us harm. But he actually did us a real blessing because <laughs> the windows were old and bad and the insurance company paid for brand new windows and we installed them and ended up with several thousand dollars left over. I mean, we have an unusual God that can even take bad things and make it be a blessing. Paul's in jail, but he knows this unusual God and he's rejoicing. Now, every New Testament doctrine has Old Testament doctrine illustrations. The Bible all fixed, fits together. And I want to show you our unusual God and how he met the need of his preacher, Elijah, through a widow woman. And you're familiar with the story. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter number 16. We find that the children of Israel were under God's judgment. Instead of being blessed the way God wanted them to bless them, they were being chastened. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd rather have the blessing than the curse. I'd rather have God's goodness than God's chastening. But they were being chastened because of the wicked uh, Jezebel and Ahab. And in verse 25, he says, they wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord. In verse 30, and Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. In verse 33, Ahab made uh, groves uh, to provoked the God of Israel. Uh, he worshiped, worshiped false gods, Baal, and, and led the people in a wrong direction. So because of that, God set a drought. And there wasn't any rain. But yet, the man of God, Elijah, was taken care of. How was he taken care of? Well, look at verse number 4 of chapter 17. And it came to pass that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he went and dwelt by the brook of Cherith, that is, before Jordan, and the ravens brought him a buzzard burger every day. Do you see that's in the Hebrew? Bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he, now that's unusual, my dad was working in Florida and in, and on a building, and he heard something behind him, and he turned around, there was this beautiful trout flopping around on the ground. And he went and picked it up. He noticed there were some claw marks in its back. The osprey had grabbed it from the ocean and was headed to the nest, and if they drop it, they won't go down and get it for fear of predators and stuff. They'll go back and get another one. So dad just put it in the, a pail of water, took it home for lunch, cleaned it, and uh, they had it for lunch. You know, God can provide in unusual ways, amen? And God provided the meal for Elijah with a buzzard burger. A raven comes in with bread and flesh. You say, where did he get it? I don't know. He didn't ask any questions. He was just thankful. God said, eat it. See, a raven was unclean. God can even use unclean things for his honor and glory. God even used the donkey to speak to his servant and to correct him, Balaam. You know, God is able to use unusual creatures, and many times they're more obedient than we are. So we see the unusual feeding, and then we see uh, here not only unusual provisions, I'm staying with the, the P, but unusual places. When the brook dried up, uh, God says in verse 9, Get thee to Zarephath, 
which belonged to the Zidonians, which is close to Zidon. So that little area was called the Zidonians, but it was actually in the area that we would call today Lebanon, north of Israel. And that day it was called uh, Phoenicia, and, uh, and, and that area uh, is where uh, this widow was at. And he says, go to Zarephath. Now, that doesn't probably mean anything to you, but it meant something to Elijah because Zarephath was the hometown of Jezebel. And Ahab and Jezebel were looking for the prophet because they were blaming the preacher for their problem. Now, it was their sin that caused the rain, but he brought the message that there wasn't going to be any rain, so they were blaming Elijah for the drought, and they were looking to kill him. So he wasn't too excited, I don't think, to go to Zarephath, but he went to an unusual place. And then he found out about unusual participants or unusual people. You know, if God's going to provide for somebody in a time of drought, you think he would have sent them to somebody that had something. Most widows I know, you know, don't have a whole lot. And he said, well, surely there's got to be some rich people, you know, that have some provision. But God says them to this poor little widow woman. And God uses his servant's problem to be a blessing to this widow and her son. And so he shows up, and of course, this unusual participants are going through unusual plight, and they see that uh, she's just gathering a few sticks and, and uh, to fix a little meal, and, and they're going to die. Notice it says in verse uh, number 9, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. You know, God was working in her heart, and he was also working in the preacher's heart. You know, God does that with us, too, as we're trying to witness. God is working in the sinner's heart, and the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, he's telling you the truth. As you're witnessing, God's working both sides and encouraging them to be saved. So he rose and obeyed the Lord, went to Zarephath, a considerable walk, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, just by chance, the woman was there gathering sticks. You know, God is able to bring people across our paths right at the right time, right when we're right there. And there she was. And he called her here and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in thy vessel, that I may drink. Water was precious. There was a, a drought. And she was willing to do that. But he pushed her a little bit over the top in the next verse. And he says, Hey, while you're going... Bring me a little bread. Bring me something to eat, too, if you would. Now, that was a little bit too much. That stretched her a little bit too far because she said, As the Lord liveth, I have not, in verse 12, uh, a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil of cruise. And behold, we're gathering two sticks, and I may go dress it for me and my son that we may eat. And die. That's all we've got. And you're asking me to take food from my child and give something to you first? See, we see unusual plight, but we see an unusual preparing. This woman was still preparing to cook what she had. She was still going to use what she had for God. How are we using what we already have? You know, she, was, she said, well, it wasn't enough. It wasn't a big meal like we had for supper at the Lewis's. Thank you very much. It wasn't all that prepared for an army, you know, or 50 people. I mean, it was a little bit. It was just a little bit. But she was going to use what she had. What are you doing with the gifts, the abilities, the talents that we have? Are we using that little bit? You know, God is looking for the unusual that we're preparing. The truth is, she had all the ingredients for success. And we have tonight all the ingredients to be successful for the Lord. He's given us his word and the blessed Holy Spirit. He's given us those to love and to teach and pastors to help us. So we see this unusual preparing and we see this unusual priority. Notice it says in verse 13, what the preacher said, and Elijah said to her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first. Isn't that what Jesus said? Seek ye first 
the kingdom of God. Make me a little bit first and bring it unto me. Luke 6, 38, give, that's first, and it shall be given unto you. Now, here's the promise. We see this prophecy, this unusual promise or unusual prophecy. He says, for thus saith the Lord God, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. He said, listen, if you give me some first, if you'll honor God and put me first, you're going to be supplied. You're going to be blessed. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. He said, well, I just got a little bit. You know, the widow, she only had a little bit, but she gave what she had. And God took notice of it. She never went without after that. <laughs> God supplied her need. The poorest person in here needs to give the most. Not I'm talking about the most in dollars and cents, but you need to give. People that don't have, you say, well, I just don't have. People that give have. People that don't give don't have. People that don't give financially always struggle and live from week to week and can't pay their bills that are always behind and always having this problem and that problem. I'm not saying if you give, you won't have any problems, but over the last 40 years or 50 years in Christian life, I've noticed that people that give have. And people that don't give don't have. People that give have money in their pocket and money in the bank, and the people that don't give, they don't. So people that honor God, she only, now, what did she have to lose? She just had to eat that little bit, and they were going to die. Right. We're all going to die. Are we going to live for self just today, or are we going to focus on eternity? She, by faith, said, okay, God, I'm going to prove you. Malachi 3, see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Okay. She makes him a little cake and brings it to him. I'm sure she's human, like you and me. She's going, boy, I don't know about this. There's not going to be much left. There wasn't much there in the first place. But when she began to pour it out, there was more for her and her son than there, there was in the beginning. And they ate of it for a year because we have an unusual God and this unusual prophecy. You know, the, <clears throat> the story doesn't end there. There's unusual peace that comes in her life that we find in verse number 15. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And if you have a reference Bible, it'll say a full year. Uh, what peace she had in her life. Now, the story doesn't end there. We're not going to go much longer. I'm just about done. But because of her obedience to the Lord, she developed a relationship with the man of God. And later, she had a lot bigger need than just the food and bread. Her son died. And she went and got the man of God. And, and I want you to see this unusual physician. The man of God comes in verse 21, and he stretches himself upon the child three times. Now, I don't know about you, but... I don't know if I'd have let somebody, hey, they, you know, that's my son. Get off him. You know, what are you doing? Laying on him. You're, you know, a big man laying on a little guy. That is, you know, three times he did it. And he cried unto the Lord, said, oh, Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. How do you know when somebody's dead when their soul leaves their body? The soul came back into that Little guy's body in verse 22, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came again into him and again, and he revived. Now I want you to see some unusual praise. <laughs> verse number 24, and the woman said to Elijah, by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. Will God do this for you if you honor him by faith and put him first? Is God a respecter 
of persons? Does Luke 6, 38 apply to you? Give and it shall be given unto you. Does Jesus' words apply to us? Seek you first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You can struggle and work and try to make it on your own, or you can say the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. God, you own it all. It's all yours. Whatever you want to do, I'm trusting and looking to you. And that's what she did, and God blessed her. One other verse, Proverbs 19, 17 says, He that hath pity on the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that, that which he hath given, he will pay him again. That's God's promise. If you give to these poor Africans or Germans, there's nobody poorer than those that are without the gospel. To help carry the gospel to them, God says, whatever you've given, I'm going to pay it back to you again. I found it true in my life. I've shared the story many times, but when we started in evangelism seven years ago, our church was having a big special offering. And it was for missions and building repair. And I think it was about three or four things. It was a special offering. The pastor had been encouraged for a month. We, want, we need a big offering. Pray, give a special offering. My wife and I prayed about it. God gave us a big figure that we were to give in the offering. Well, that week before, I'm going to... Uh, a church, and we preached four days, Sunday to Wednesday. We spent $85 in gas going back and forth, and they gave us $135. And I subtracted 85 from 135, and then I divided by four, and I said, you know what, I'm not making very much per day. And here we are giving this big offering in the, in the offering. I wasn't giving cheerfully, I'll be honest. But, uh, but we did give. You know, it's better to do right wrongly than not to do right at all. But it's better to do right rightly because God loveth the cheerful giver. Well, that week I flew to Edmonton. And when I got to the airport, the pastor said, I'm sorry, but I'm leaving. I'm flying back to Detroit. He flies back to Detroit. And that week, the church gave me the biggest offering we have ever received in the seven years of our ministry. When I came back, I said, honey, we need to start giving more in the offering. We gave, and we got the biggest offering back, more than twice what we put in the offering. I just challenge you as, 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 an, as a visiting evangelist, you can trust God. Amen. He's an unusual God. He supplies in mysterious ways, but he will meet your needs if you'll put him first and honor him. Would you stand, please, with their heads bowed and their eyes closed?